Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what Mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio. Join host George Smart and Frank King as they talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Show your support by reviewing us at iTunes and visiting U.S. Modernist's massive archives at usmodernist.org. And now, America's only modernist comedian, just back from yet another round the world cruise, Frank King. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kids, I got great news. This year, just like every year, Palm Springs has a huge event called Shark Week. And our own George Swartwick. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. It's in the desert. Oh, I'm, yeah, that's a <laughs> land shark. Uh, Palm Springs has a huge event called Modernism Week. That's, that's it. it. Yep. And our own George Smart was there talking with the keynote speakers from what is essentially, uh, well, it's a, a 10-day martini party in amazing residential architecture. Can you imagine that? Getting drunk at other people's houses. What a concept. Today we join George at the Hotel Skylark talking about the Harvard Five, uh, not the basketball team, by the way, with architect and historian Bill Earls and producer Devon Chivas. Then later, Devin, Devin, right, Devin. I was, <laughs> I was just testing you, George. And then later he explores the work of Paul Springs architect. I think I got this one myself. Hugh Captor with filmmaker. Okay, wait for it, Bert. Simonis, yes, shoots, <laughs> scores. Thank you. That's what his mom calls him. <laughs> yeah, that's all righty. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Moho Realty. Bless their little hearts. Are you having a hard <laughs> time finding or selling a modernist home? <laughs> hey, Sarah Sonka, Moho Realty, is a real estate agent who gets modern like you do. She loves these great houses, and she has the expertise, experience, and track record to close your deal www.moho-realty.com or 919-601-7339. And U.S. Modernist Masters Gallery, featuring profiles on every cotton picking, gravy licking last modernist house in this country by nearly, is it just this country, guys? Just this country. Right. Every major 20th century architect, all the Wrights, all the Schindlers, all the Neutras, all the Lautners, heck, got all four of those right. Over 5,000 from Alto <laughs> to Zanitos. Aren't those shoes? Sounds like a yes. snack. Warning, this website is highly addictive, and we cannot be held responsible if you stay up all night and miss work the next day. Dive in at <laughs> www.usmodernist.org. Hi, I'm George Smart with U.S. Modernist Radio. We are here poolside at the Hotel Skylark in Palm Springs, California, talking today with Bill Earls, author and architect of the Harvard Five in New Canaan, mid-century modern houses by, and you'll hear this list in a moment, I know that most people in America can probably name the six Brady children, but they can't necessarily name the Harvard Five, so I'm going to let Bill do that. How you doing, Bill? Very well, thank you. Who were the Harvard Five? They were Marcel Breuer, Elliot Noyes, John Johansson, Landis Gores, and Philip Johnson. So, did they all go to Harvard, or did somebody just name them that like a basketball team? <laughs> well, uh, four of them went to Harvard. Uh, Breuer was a teacher there at Harvard, uh, so that's what they had in common. The other four were students there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and how did this uh, appellation come about? Uh, who, who, who anointed them, the Harvard Five? That is up for debate. Uh, I'm really not sure. The first time I saw it is in an article written for the New Canaan Historical Society in 1966. And it was just as a title to a paragraph in a, in a, in a pamphlet on this group. Uh, and I don't know if it was ever really mentioned uh, after that. Uh, until I put it on the cover of my book, now it seems to be just ubiquitous. 
uh, especially from the real estate agents in town who love to use this as a label. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we hear it all the time. Frank Lloyd Wright House. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this adds some value in people's minds to, the, oh, one of these guys did this, even if they didn't know who those guys were necessarily. Hang on a second. Old for helicopter. Old for helicopter, yeah. I don't think we have the any officials at Sunnylands today. Because oh. they're doing tours. You know who was here, though? Who? Bernie Sanders. I forgot to oh, tell you that on Tuesday night. Oh, really? Yes. Huh. Yes, not here at the Skylark, but he was around town. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been awesome if yeah. we had Bernie Sanders here at the Skylark. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that would be something to write home about. Now, that voice you hear is Devin Chivas, who is a documentary filmmaker and is working closely with Bill on a documentary on one of the Harvard Five, uh, Elliot Noyes, who is not a household name in American architecture, but is certainly well-known in the New England area. Tell us about Elliot Noyes. Let me correct that. Uh, Devin's uh, documentary is on the Harvard Five. Okay. So so tell us about Elliot Noyes. Okay. Elliot Noyes... um, um, was a graduate of the Graduate School of Design, the Harvard School of Architecture. Uh, he is probably best known uh, for being a, uh, a pioneer in, in branding. That is, uh, taking not just a design uh, concept to uh, a particular client, but in his case, the clients were corporations, in many cases. Uh, the, the mobile uh Corporation IBM, where he he didn't just suggest uh, a look for a building or a plan for a building, but came back to them and said, no, what you really need is an overall branding strategy, which doesn't sound that unique now, but was very unique when he brought that to the table. Was this corporate branding or product branding or both? So he took literally the IBM typewriters and redesigned the look of the typewriters. He brought the graphic designers in to change the the look of the IBM logo. Uh, At IBM, the offices all look different. If you had offices in New York or Chicago, they all look different. Even the letterheads were different on on the correspondence they gave. And he came in and said, no, no, there should be some uh, universal look to this that'll help establish the brand image. But I know that the, the look and feel of the Selectric typewriter mm-hmm. was quite remarkable for his time. Was that part of his work as well? Yes, it was. That was designed in New Canaan. Uh, they literally made styrofoam and clay models to get the look, the physical look of the typewriters there. So, Devin, how are you going about reconstructing some of, of the Harvard Five's lives to tell their story? Well... One of the most amazing things that we've done is interviewed for hundreds of hours some of the most um, well-known people who either were actually one of the Harvard Five, and that's John Johansson. He was still alive when I had the great fortune to interview him at his own home for several hours, thanks to Bill, who set that interview up for me. Um, But I'm also really trying to connect with the people who who were there in the time that this explosion of creativity and mid-century architecture was being constructed in the town of New Canaan. Um, A big part of my story is to try and figure out what was it about New Canaan that allowed for this kind of architecture to to, to spring up there, and what was it about New Canaan that attracted the Harvard Five. So the story that I'm trying to tell, which goes along with with Bill's book, is a personal story. Who were these men? Why did they go to New Canaan? What was it about New Canaan um, that allowed for this revolution to happen? So interviewing um, people who were there in the moment, as well as interviewing the experts. So another example is Jen Sreesome, who just passed away. Um, yes. Had some really lovely long interviews with him as well about furniture design and why furniture design was just as important for the revolution of, of modernism. Um, and then we have uh, somebody like my mother who grew up in a noise house. It's the Bremer house. It's fairly well known. Um, and her parents were part of the group of these creative folks who were designing these crazy houses. So my mom has very specific personal memories of Breuer himself, of Elliot Noyes. Um, and so that really brings that, that very personal perspective and connection to the story. Now, the 
the Harvard Five, they, they weren't like a basketball team, right? I mean, they didn't like hang out together all the time, or, or did they? There was some camaraderie, but uh, as is, is usual between architects, there's also competition. And uh, it's interesting. I remember one of the first times I met John Black Lee, who was not one of the one of the five, uh, technically, but kind of the next generation after them. Uh, it was at uh, the um, Stackpole House, and he he was there. Um, no, I take that back. It was at Nina, it was at your, your grandmother's house, at Nina Bremer's house, and. He was repairing a stair. Like one of the stair treads had gotten loose. Yeah, he designed and, those. And so I, I went in to see Nina, your grandmother, and, and yet John Black Lee was there literally on the stair with a wrench and tightening up nuts and bolts on this thing. And he was saying, look, you know, I was the fellow who drew the stair up. And now he, he's there 50 years later repairing the stair himself. I love that. <laughs> so <it> just, <laughs> it's so cool. But I'm sorry. Um, no, that's no, a great no, story. No. Keep going. I'm, <laughs> I'm fascinated. <laughs> um, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> was, well, I think uh, the question was, did they hang out like a, a basketball uh, team uh, or were, did, were they contentious? What's and, interesting is like someone like John Black Lee, who would have worked for those fellows at the time as a draftsman, that, that phenomenon actually still, I, I was involved in that phenomenon generations later. That thing that still happens where one firm has a big project, they borrow from another firm. Yes. And so in a compact town especially, you'll say, oh, I know my pal has a firm across town. I've got more work. I want to borrow one of his fellows. And so there was this back and forth. So, so, there, so there is camaraderie, but there's competition. Um, I know Fred Noyes will tell you that when his father, Elliot, lost a job to Philip Johnson, he was quite readily annoyed. And, and I know, uh, Devin, you, you've told me where the parents interviewed Breuer and Noyes to see who which was the best fit. And there are even records in, in at the Historical Society where people had left these kind of sheets of left and right. This is one architect on the left, another architect on the right, and here's the pros and cons of each to help themselves decide on who to use. It's a very funny town in that it is still a small town. There's less than 20,000 people. Yes. And yet such a high density of architects. It sort of defies logic in a way. Uh, I think architects are drawn there uh, partly because the town is charming and compact. And there's a, an old housing, an old uh, building stock there that is uh, a good place to set up an office in. Look, on your lunch hour, you can pop over to the, to the get, your, get a sandwich at the, lunch, at the lunch shop. You can go to the post office, go to the bank, and be back, ready to work again. <laughs> you know, you can walk to all those things. They're all together that way. So architects love that. Architects find that very appealing, the physical setup of the town. I think the, the reason the, those, the Harvard Five located there was it's an hour commute to Manhattan, okay? And yet it was off the main thoroughfare of highways and of, of the railroad. It's on a spur line of the railroad, so the land was relatively inexpensive. It wasn't uncommon to buy a, a building lot for $1,000 and maybe spend $10,000 to build a very inexpensive house. Those numbers are quite different now. Now it's not uncommon to spend almost the same amount on the lot as you would to build a house there. Oh, sure, yeah. You know. But back then, the land was cheap. Even when I started there in town 20-some years ago, there were still farms. You know, there were still people raising chickens and these kind of things. Those are all gone now. And when I started there, there was maybe one good place to eat. And now it is, you know, a mecca for restaurants. So the character has changed even in the time that I've known it. Now, besides the Harvard Five, wasn't there also like a New York Five? Ah, well, the New York Five, there's this wonderful book, The New York Five. Actually, I had received that as a gift uh, before I even started architecture school. And, and that was what, Meyer and Guathme, and I'm trying to remember the other... Right, John Hedgick, uh-huh. Guathme Siegel, uh, Peter Eisenman, Michael Graves. Michael Graves, right. yes. And so they were all relatively young, and there wasn't a whole lot of work then. Uh, they're really from the, their, their youth was in the 70s, and when they were trying to find work, and so they did a lot of drawing. And they were very interested in theory. And they're, I don't know if they're derogatory called, but they're called the whites. Okay. And, and as the whites, they were, it was all just primarily theory. And even the houses, there are some houses in Litchfield County, there's some houses like in Cornwall. They, they got built. Like, Eisenman got some of these houses built. 
and they're called aggressively unfunctional houses. Ooh, I love okay. that. <laughs> I know some people that are aggressively unfunctional. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> but I was so I the, the copy of this book that I was given was in Italian. I couldn't read it. But I was so fascinated by the, especially the drawings. Their, their primary drawing vehicle was the axonometric drawing, where the, each part of the drawing is, you can put a scale on it, you can scale the drawing off. And, and as opposed to a perspective drawing, where no part of the drawing is, is a technical drawing at all. Right. The axonometric is really a technical drawing, and that's what they, so Eisenman would start just with a cube, let's say. Just a cube, and then start cutting it up, rotating it, slicing it, just purely an exercise in graphics. But then translated these to actual buildings. So, there, the New York Five came after the Harvard Five, uh, but actually it was it was the New York Five that that got me interested in architecture, and I eventually went to school to study. And I kind of the title of my book, I enjoyed that it was kind of a riff on the New York Five. Wouldn't it have been great to like have had a basketball game or <laughs> or something between the Harvard Five and the New York Five? I mean, you could see them playing each other in the garden. <laughs> that would have been amazing. I bet you the Harvard Five would have won, though. They're pretty athletic and kind of wild. There's a lot of martini drinking yeah. involved yeah. with yeah. them. John Johansson would always say, I think it always starts and ends with martinis. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I have sort of a random question for you. Um, is Jim Evans still around in New Canaan? No, there's a great Jim Evans house there. Though. I know the house. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't. Did know he pass him. away? I don't know. I don't know him. He was born in 1925, hmm. and last I hmm. checked, he was still still with us. Wow. But he, hmm. he built a, a hyperbolic paraboloid right. roofed house. Right that uh, was after a very famous one from our area, the Eduardo hmm. Catalano House, which was the first one in 1954. Hmm. And as soon as we started our website 10 years ago and had a picture of that house, which is on there still, people sent me Jim Evans photos from New Canaan. Huh. I think there's a, a New Yorker cool. cartoon where uh, if you're an architect, you have to invent a new roof. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the bottom line. The only way to make yourself as an architect is invent the roof. But that house, I know, it's funny. When you approach it, you approach it from the very lowest point of that house. And then you're seeing a lot of roof. And honestly, modern houses, the, the low, low-pitched roofs are not that the most attractive. Right. You know, But when you're in that house, you're under that one continuous roof. And then these... These spaces are just defined by, by almost furniture in a way. You know, the, there's a wall of cabinetry here, and there's a bookcase here, and that defines those spaces in under that one arching roof. So, Devin, in putting this documentary together, um, it's a work in progress, right? Yes, it is a work in progress. And it's a, um, it's a good. What do you call? It's not a trailer. What do you call it? Well, we have a trailer cut. Yeah, which is like okay. a tease for what the ultimate film will be. And that's be. on YouTube. It's on Vimeo, and it's on my website, which is theharvard5.com. And five is spelled out. It's not the number. So theharvard5.com. And that has a whole lot of information about the film, including the trailer on it. Now, what can we do to support the film? Can we all, like, have a giant bake sale? Is there a Kickstarter page? I mean, what can we do to throw money at this? Yes, just throw money. <laughs> if it's as easy as that, throw as much money as you can. Um, we can do whatever anybody is willing to do. Um, any size financial donation or, or help um, in any other way, it all helps. And... Once the ball gets rolling on the fundraising, it's sort of like lemmings jumping off a cliff. Or at least I hope that's what it's going to be like. Yeah. Where one, fo- one does it first and then the rest of them follow. So to that end, I thank you very, very much for pledging the gift towards the film that you have pledged. Because we will um, be posting people's gifts, whether anonymously or in their names as well, on the website. We're not actually going to pay you, but we're we'll, we'll pledge. <laughs> I was no, trying no to problem. throw you a bone. <laughs> yeah, until I see the check is cleared, we're not talking. I'm not going to release this. Maybe a, a, a small animated short of that basketball game between the Harvard Five and the New York Five as, we as a teaser. That, we could, yeah, we could probably make that happen, maybe. <laughs> well, thank you both for joining me this afternoon. I hope you have a great time here in Palm Springs. Thank you. Thank it's you. been awesome.
stay with us. As he used to say when I was a kid, don't touch that dial. <laughs> There's more with documentary filmmaker Bert Simonas coming up. Hello, I'm George Smart, and we are broadcasting from the Hotel Skylark in Palm Springs, sitting by the pool, drinking some uh, vodka substances with uh, Bert Simonis, who is a filmmaker and storyteller. Uh, he, he lives here in Palm Springs. He's originally from the Netherlands. I am right? from the Netherlands, yes. yes. And how did you get over to the States? Well, my parents uh, immigrated when I was uh, in elementary school and ended up you know, going to school, high school, university. Um, here in California. Now, what was the next part of your journey? So how did you get into documentary filmmaking? Well, I've been a, I've been a writer and a storyteller most of my life, all my life. My mom will say, um, I started writing stories while I was in elementary school. Um, I've published a number of, of mystery fiction books. Um, and I was approached by a friend uh, in common uh, and... and uh, he said, hey, will you, you help me? I need some marketing assistance. I need some scripting assistance. Um, will you help me develop the script for this new film that I'm making? Um, and he's the one with the background in, in filmmaking. I, I made a film while I was in high school using Dad's borrowed Bell & Howell Super 8 camera. But I, I wouldn't that consider... That sounds like the Goldbergs on TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't consider myself a filmmaker. I'm a storyteller. Okay. Um, but, you know, what we're doing now is telling visual stories um, with making these films. So... Um, I got involved. We formed a company, and we've now made five documentary films. Um, I don't consider us successful, but if I talk to other filmmakers at film festivals, since we have money in the bank, we are successful. Oh, yeah. It's tough to be a documentary filmmaker. I, there are only two that I know of that make a living. It's Michael Moore and Ken Burns, and the rest do other things to support themselves, whether it's writing or making commercials or something else. And Ken Burns, wasn't he, besides his documentaries, wasn't he most famous for that zooming shot that he did of photos? Ken Burns actually has an effect named after him in Final Cut, which is the editing program that most filmmakers use. Um, it's called the Ken Burns effect, and it is indeed a zoom out or zoom in effect on a still photo. On a still photo. Yeah. And I, I can't believe, did he invent that or just popularize it? I, I can't, I can't believe that he invented it, but I, 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 you know, it certainly has his name all over it. And it, but it's for a filmmaker, it's an interesting way of bringing a photo to life. Yeah, sure. Right. If you if you start in close up on an image and then pull back to reveal the other things that are also in this image, it's telling a visual story. And really, that's what filmmaking is. It's it's telling a story with pictures that move. Now you're in uh, Palm Springs. Of course, you live here. And you're here during Modernism Week to talk about your documentary on Hugh Capter. But what was your first documentary or two? What did you do those on? Well, the, the first documentary that, that my business partner John did without me, it's called The Last First Comic. And it is about the last surviving burlesque comedian or comic. Uh, people that included Henny Youngman, Jack Benny, uh, Milton Berle, um, and Irv Benson was the last of those that was still alive. He died last May at 102. Wow. And But fortunately, before he passed away, um, John and, and his co-producer at the time, Bart Williams, were able to capture Irv's story about how uh, American comedy really got a start during the vaudeville and burlesque era. Um, and then John, I helped John out with marketing that film. Um, and then we, the first team-up that we did where we really worked on a story together is called Mid-Century Moderns, The Homes That Define Palm Springs. And it's about how the Alexander Construction Company had a dramatic effect on the landscape of Palm Springs by building uh, architect-designed homes for the middle class. Um, so, sure, Frank Sinatra had a beautiful modernist house here in Palm Springs, and so did several other people. But it wasn't until the people who were behind the scenes working in the studios could afford weekend houses in Palm Springs. The Alexanders did that for them. They were trying to make it affordable in the beginning? They were, they were basically trying to make it affordable. They were much like Eichler did in very much like Silicon Eichler. Valley. Yep. 
like Eichler did in, in uh, San Mateo Highlands and in, in Menlo Park, Palo Alto, uh, parts of Santa Clara. Um, Eichler was a builder, used architects, a Quincy Jones who has built houses here as well. And the Alexanders were, were builders who also used a Quincy Jones and Charles Dubois and, of course, the big one, William Kreisel. Right. Who's still said, alive, right? Bill Kreisel is still alive. Um, we spoke to him when we were making that film. Actually, we, we traded emails back and forth. Bill is older, and I would kindly say he's a bit crotchety, but um, <laughs> he still has all of his senses and, and is certainly aware of what's going on. I understand that the, he and a fellow named Chris Minrad are working here in town, bringing back a lot of uh, the houses that Kreisel did 20, 30, 50 years ago. That's correct. Um, Chris Minrad's a realtor who lives over in the Twin Palms area, and he lives in a absolutely gorgeous floating bl- butterfly that Chrysler designed. And, and Menrad really uh, went out and sought out Bill uh, when he was uh, redoing his house. And, and of course, Chrysler is also a landscape architect, and, and Menrad had Bill redo his landscaping. And then Chris has gone on from there to restore other houses in that same neighborhood, um, as Chris says. The, all the houses in Twin Palms, which was really the Alexander's first development here in Palm Springs, are the same size. They're exactly the same layout. Um, they're built on a 40 by 40 foot slab, so that gives them 1,600 square feet. Yes. And Chrysler very cleverly changed the roof lines or the facades, and they all look different um, so that it doesn't look like cookie cutter tracked houses. Um, but they were inexpensive to build because there was really only one set of plans. Um, and they were all, all built on, on slab foundations. So uh, the Alexanders um, were able to sell these houses at a good price and then uh, move forward into other developments in Palm Springs. Now, another architect from the mid-century who's still around is Hugh Kapter, the subject of your movie. Correct. Tell us about Hugh. Um, Hugh uh, came out here uh, in about 1956. Um, he first came out when he was in the Marines. Um, passed through here, was stationed in Southern California for a while, went to Korea, um, came back, uh, of course fell in love with the place, uh, found a woman, of course, in in Southern California, um, got married, um, but he was working in a nursery and and couldn't make a living. Um, His father was a principal in the GM design studio back in New York. So he called up his dad and said, you know, if I move back to New York, do you have a job for me? And his dad says, get your butt back here. We've got a job for you. So Hugh worked in the in the design studios uh, for GM for a while, doing things like Autorama, um, which was a traveling showcase around the country, uh, showing futuristic designs of all kinds of things, cars, kitchens. I thought Autorama was that uh, machine you would go to in the 60s where you put the uh, coins in. It's an you automat. Got your, that's an automat. Automat. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So... <laughs> Easily, easily <laughs> confusable. So, of course, Hugh was homesick, as his wife was, for the West Coast. So they moved to Palm Springs. Uh, Hugh's first design was a real estate office for his in-laws. Um, that building still stands. It's now a taco stand over in, uh, I think it's San Pedro. Um, and then he d- went on to design other things, including... Uh, the, what is now the Triangle Inn here in Palm Springs, it still stands. Um, and over the years, um, he continued to design, then he went into development. So during the day, he was doing architecture work, and by night, he was at the city council trying to convince them that you know the plans he had drawn up should be approved and built. Are there some new captor houses here in town? There are several new captor houses. Um, He teamed up with a local realtor, um, and he designed three different plans, three different layouts for a street named Captor Court. It's actually fairly close to here. Um, The realtor, the developer, the the builder, uh, picked one of those plans and built three identical houses, so they're the same layout. He, he, what he did do is mirror the roof lines so that they look a bit different. But there are three houses here that are new, that are, you know, have that, have that captor flair, that captor design, um, which is unique. Um, but of course, they're built to today's standards and today's specifications. So uh, 
I like the houses. I like the style of them. Um, I don't know, given the location, since it's on a small court, you know, one block off of the main street, how successful they're going to be in selling them. Okay. Um, but but they're nice houses. They're definitely nice houses. And when you walk in, it's it it's like any Hugh Capter designed structure. Um, you you feel protected. Um, you know, we're sitting here poolside at the end of April, and the sun is shining, and people are in their bathing suits. And it's not like that here in August. Um, you know, it, it'll be 115 poolside. Holy cow! And we'd be lucky to be sitting inside where it's air conditioned. Um, so, Captor's designs, uh, and as an architect who you know has lived in the desert for longer than I've been alive, he knows this environment and takes this environment into consideration when designing his houses and designs them so that or lays them out as well so that you don't have a lot of windows exposed to the southern sun Yes, Um, windows in fact are up high um, so that you have light you have views but you don't have heat Um, and, and when you walk in they have sort of a sort of a native feeling, kind of cave-like. Um, while we were researching the film, there's there's actually a term for it. Uh, it's carencia. Which carencia. Is carencia. It's a Spanish word. And, and Ernest Hemingway wrote about it, and he, he described it, what it com- where it comes from is from bullfighting. And carencia is that spot in the bull ring where the bull feels safest, and he decides, you know, as as the bullfight goes along. At some at some point in time he finds this spot and that's his carencia. That's where he goes. He feels safe there. He's very difficult to to actually kill from from that standpoint because now he knows that he can defend himself. And and that feeling, that carencia is what you get when you walk into a captor structure because you know he's got your back. He's going to protect you from that 120 degree desert heat or our winds or our blowing sand that we have here and and you can't help but but feel good when you walk into one of his houses or one of his buildings the documentary is called it's called quiet elegance the architecture of hugh captor um and where can people find this um it, we're we're putting it on amazon prime right now um we have a website this and that films dot net um, and as soon as it is approved by Amazon Prime, which we hope to be within the next couple of days, um, we'll link to it from our website. So this and that films.net will have uh, a link to that. Um, we also have it on DVD um, so that you can watch it streaming on your television or you can uh, buy one of our DVDs and we'll gladly ship it out to you. So I believe I sent you one earlier this year. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's an amazing story, um, and now Hugh's about to turn, I think, 86 in May, Yes, and he's still practicing. He just um, redesigned for the city um, the South End Fire Station. Um, of course, when he first designed it in the 70s, um, there were no female firefighters. Now there are. And uh, the city has asked uh, him to redesign and, and expand the fire station. And what's nice is that that when when that addition is completed, it's going to fit right in. It's not going to look like, you know, somebody had an old building and then pasted something onto it. Um, it's coming from the same brain, the same hands that designed the original building. So he's still working, which is just amazing. And and he's actually the last living desert modernist you know like we talked about Bill's still alive but Bill has lived in Los Angeles a long all time his, all yes. his career yeah he's actually he was actually born in Shanghai but um, he's lived in Los Angeles a long long time and he's still there and and Hugh has lived out here in the desert um, for half a century and more well you can find all the capture houses on our website at usmodernist.org uh, thank you so much Bert for coming out and talking with me Spending a little time here by the pool. You're very welcome, George. Hey, thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by the fabulous Sarah Sonk, the real estate agent who loves modernist houses just as much as you and I do. 
You can reach her at 919-601-7339. And by U.S. Modernist Magazine Library, where we're working on collecting and scanning every major U.S. architecture magazine since 1930, because we have no lives. It's searchable, downloadable, and completely free at www.usmodernist.org. Okay, take us out, Thomas. All right. Visit usmodernist.org for more information about today's guests. U.S. Modernist Radio is edited by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, N.C. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of North Carolina Modernist Houses, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. Show your support by writing a great review of us on iTunes. We can give you a template to get you started. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> George and Frank and I'll be back in two weeks for another Miracle Whip, flag-waving, hot-dog-eating, apple-pie-loving edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Modernist Radio.